Great. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this panel discussion on making business work for development, the UK experience. Uh, my name is Zahid Torres Rahman. I'm the director of Business Fights Poverty. Um, and I consider myself very fortunate because I have a great vantage point over the business and development space. And there's two things that strike me um, from that position around, around the lam landscape. One is the huge creativity that is is happening around this interface of business and development. Uh, people who are thinking about new ways to harness business. The second thing that strikes me is the diversity in the people who are innovating. So you see people from uh, small business, entrepreneurs, as re was referred to earlier. These are people who work in big companies. You see people working in government, people working in NGOs. Um, but really a whole ecosystem of people who are starting to think about how to harness business. Now, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that what we're witnessing is a creative revolution in the way we fight poverty by harnessing business. It's a whole different way of thinking and I think it has very exciting uh, possibilities. Um, and we're fortunate to be joined today by four people who I consider to be at the, the vanguard of this creative revolution. Uh, we're from my far left, Chris Brett, who's global, he global head of uh, corporate responsibility and sustainability at Olam International. Penny Fowler, who's the head of the private sector team at Oxfam GB. Uh, Alex McGilvery, who's the director of development impact at CDC. And Alistair Fernie, who's the head of the private sector department at the UK's Department for International Development, or DFID to your friends. Um, so I'm really interested to hear what you're going to say about, uh, about this topic. We want to understand a bit about where you see the, the successes. Some practical answers would be good, uh, but also where you see uh, areas where we need to do more. Um, so, without uh, further ado, let me just turn to, to Chris. Um, you know, I've known about the case of Olam for a while, and it's always struck me as a really good example of a company harnessing their core business to have a dominant impact. Can you tell us more about your story? Okay, um, well, there's a great opportunity to come here, and uh, th th there's a timer looking at me here of 10 minutes, so I'm going to go at a reasonable speed. Uh, my objective is basically to get everyone to sort of understand what our OLAM business model is, uh, and also where we've worked with development, and how we are really interesting as well to development partners. So number one, OLAM International, we're head office Singapore, public listed company. Uh, we're a $20 billion turnover agricultural supply chain company. We've just hit our 25th year, born out of Nigeria, so there's a very strong African roots there. Um, so when you look at the company as it is, today we're global leader in several products. I won't go into detail, but we cover 21 agricultural products and work in 65 countries, emerging markets, all continents, we work in the US, Australia and so on. So what I wanted to take you through a little bit of a journey on, on, on a several components of the supply chain we work on because we obviously work with the farmers, the small holders, large scale farmers, our own farming businesses, all the way through procurement, trading, processing, logistics and then selling products into the market, packaged food products, into African and Asian markets, not European, not American, so those markets, but also selling to our large scale customers, uh, well a whole range of customers, for example your Nestle, your Unilever, your Kraft, your Mondelez, Costco, etc. So firstly, small holders, absolutely critical to Olam. We have 3.9 million farmers connected to Olam. Now if you said, how do you know that? I'm not saying I've counted everyone, I'm not trying to claim that, but we can look at the tonnage of product that comes through, your cocoa, your cashew, your cotton, your coffee, your sesame, all of these products, very dominated by small holders. We can work out very clearly what average yields are, and then scale it down to farmer connections, products by country and so on. So there's a message for you that we do measure this data. So we've got these 3.9 million farmers. Now, how do we connect to them? I mean, that is really the question. I mean, development organizations have helped us immensely on improving that connection. Now, the first connection point is that four years ago, we looked at Olam and we were a typical company doing projects. Projects all over the place. There was a project in cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire in one area, another area. There was projects in rice. There was projects in sesame and so on. So we decided the best thing to do was to bring these projects under a banner 
and uh, an OLAM livelihood charter. Make it simple, make it straightforward. Eight guiding principles. I'd love to spend a day telling you about it, but I, ha I haven't got the time. Please do refer to the web, you'll see all of this stuff. So those eight guiding principles, we apply to a project. The principle is training, a principle is improving yield, premiums, all that kind of thing. Building in systems and verifying, and I'm using the word verifying systems to the standards we've set. Some of those projects and programs have scaled up to be third-party certified Rainforest Alliance or fair trade, organic, all those kind of standards there in the supply chain. So that's a, a, an umbrella, a banner across OLAM. We've now migrated out of those 3.9 million farmers, we have a full traceable linked element to 314,600 and something farmers directly under those projects and initiatives under the OLAM charter. Now, that all sounds well and good, but how do we manage that system? And the first message to say is we integrate smallholders into processing units. So OLAM is investing in processing units in origin. And when I say a processing unit, that could be a cashew processing plant, cocoa processing, coffee, cotton gin, dehydration plant for vegetables, all that kind of thing. So our objective is to shorten the supply chain by putting the processing unit, an appropriate processing unit, not massive not small, appropriate to the environment. So we build, for example, a cotton gin that will process 25,000 tonne of seed cotton. We connect that to, say, 20, 22,000 farmers. So there's a clear goal. There's the processing unit, build the supply chain, integrate. The processing unit becomes the hub of extension activities, support to farmers, pre-finance, all of those kind of things. So that's, that's a really strong business model. By doing that, we've been become very attractive to development partners because they see what we do and they can understand what we do. So we've done a lot of work and get funding through those systems, through foundations, through USAID, through the Gates Foundation, a lot of areas of development. And that development is used to fund specific activities like farmer training. There's a big influence, of course, on farmer training. It's huge cost to Olam. We share that cost. And that has got a huge development impact. And, of course, a way of improving livelihoods to farmers and improving product to us. So that's sort of one message. So that's the Olam Livelihood Charter. The other thing I want to explain is that we are large-scale farmers as well. So we've got the smallholder model, and we've got what we call the Olam Plantations, Concessions, and Farms business. Now I manage all of the issues related to land. Now I know land's a, a real interesting, difficult conversation, so I want to explain here. We do manage vast areas of plantation, coffee, palm, uh, rubber, we have timber concessions, we have farming operations, we have almond concessions, we have dairy farms. You can build that picture. This is our direct agricultural production related directly to our own processing units. So that's fully integrated into Ola. Now we worked quite strongly actually over the last few years with donors, um, investor groups on developing the sustainable, um, you know, the UN principles of land and investment. OLAM was part of the G8 discussion last year which was hosted by DFID on the three T's, land transparency, tax and data transparency. We signed up fully to the land transparency and from that we've developed our own internal OLAM plantations, concessions and farming code. That code is applied across all of our, we call it upstream businesses, our farming businesses. And I think it's really critical that we um, understand that it's important that we've heard John talk about standards and, and systems and certifications. That's really important. In Palm, we've got the Roundtable Sustainable Arm, um, Palm Oil, RSPO. I'm sure most of us are familiar with that. OLAM's a big player in that. We're on all the working groups, etc. So I'm going to use this expression. We can hide, if we want, behind the RSPO and say we're doing it to that standard. Sounds great. But we'd be rather be proactive and raise the standard, number one. But number two, we do rubber. There is no standard in rubber. We do coffee plantations. There's no standard in coffee. We do rice farming in Nigeria, large scale. There is no standard in rice farming per se. So what we're trying to do there is have our own standards so we can communicate and show to people how we do that. And we worked a lot with NGOs on those standards, um, a lot of support. So that's, that's another area of our business which I welcome to take questions on. Obviously you can talk about a lot of areas. But just on another thing, 
very quickly, when you look at development, we've now, we, we have a lot of funding from development financial institutions. We all know the IFC, we have funding from the African Development Bank, from KFW, DEG, FMO, Probarco, all of these development banks look at OLAM because they like the idea that we invest, invest in origin, we invest in country, build those farming supply chains. So we now have our processing units getting funded like by the IFC, specific to that processing unit. Then they also help to monitor the development impact of that business. So it really is showing that we are trying to improve the farmer conditions around and make that business viable. So that, that's another key area of how we work. The other area that we're very interested in development is that I'm ex explaining to you that we're an agribusiness company, and this is my final point, we're an agribusiness company. What do we know about health and education? Okay? Whereas that service or the government and NGOs and pressure is put on us to deliver health and education to our workers, their dependents, the communities and so on. And you know, we accept a large level of that responsibility, but we're also able to turn around and put together the facilities and the mechanism for a lot of NGOs to reach their goal. For example, we have 3,000 women working in our cashew processing plants, very large concentrations in Ivory Coast, Mozambique, Tanzania, Ghana. A lot of NGOs want to work on women's health. How do you get a group of women together. Well, if you come to an OLAM factory, you've got 3,000. So there's a lot of ways that we work with NGOs. We build you know, facilities within the processing units. We have community outreach programs you know, to integrate to the community. So health and education, critical. We support, but we're not completely delivering. So I think there's an interesting point there of business and development. So lots of other points here, but I, I have to stop. All right? Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, we both heard earlier a Shanko made a very powerful point from Tata around the need to embed this into your DNA. It sounds like you are embedding this into your DNA. What Shanko also talked about internal and external drivers. What was the driver for you to do this? Well, to be honest, the driver, there's two drivers. If you look at basically internal drivers, it makes sense. It makes business sense. If you get this right, there is a very, very strong added financial advantage to the business if you integrate the sustainability practices, number one. Number two, if you are also looking at it, you access finance. We, we need finance to grow our business. So by the way we do this work, we are complying to the IFC performance standards on, on business. So we will get long-term investment interest. And the DFIs have a longer-term horizon interest in agriculture. We all know that plantations take a long time to grow. Commercial banks and other banks can be quite difficult over this financing. The other thing is, to be honest, the last point is customer differentiation. We are supplying our customers. Our customers expect us to have good labour standards, environmental standards, social standards, etc. across the supply chain. So there is a lot of drivers for that. We can't sell to a Nestle or to Unilever and so on unless we can define our sustainable sourcing model, particularly on products like cocoa, which we're a global leader in, which are incredibly sensitive on issues like child labour, etc. People want to have comfort in who they do their business with. So there's a clear business advantage in what we do. Thank you, Chris. Um, turn to you, Penny. We've known each other for many years. I was thinking about the other day. It's over a decade. Um, and I've always considered you as a, a leader in, in the space of NGO engagement with business. Oxfam GB, you've got some really interesting partnerships with business, but also some very robust programs uh, of advocacy in terms of um, what business should do and shouldn't do. Can you tell, this, tell us a bit more about, uh, about that, that journey and what you've learned? Sure, so um, I'm sure many people will know Oxfam quite well um, and the areas of work we, we do, humanitarian response, long-term development and trying to change the policies and practices that we see as being essential to have a system-wide change that's come up several times in the debate today. Um, we're part Oxfam GB of Oxfam International, a family of I think it's now 17 Oxfams around the world and um, I think since, particularly since about the uh, mid 2000s we tried to take a more systematic approach to um, considering the role of business in our, in our development work. So um, I think we had increasingly before that been engaging with business but our focus had more been on the role of governments and the role of civil society and we, we recognised that we really had to more systematically look at um, and analyse the role of business. Yeah. <laughs> 
And I think that where that's taken to us to is, um, and, kind of, and we're still learning and, and developing our own approach to business engagement, but what we try and do is engage constructively with businesses that we see are trying to do the right thing and are, are, are taking on a leadership um, role. And we will, at the same time, continue to challenge and seek to hold to account companies that are, are, are not doing that and are perhaps having a, a, a less um, positive impact on, on communities and the, the people living in poverty that Oxfam cares about. So um, I want to just talk a little bit about one initiative that we're currently working on. We um, are recognising the growing um, an encouraging sign of, of businesses that are, are seeing that they have a really critical role to play and that their financial sustainability over the longer term really depends on them taking account of social and environmental issues. And um, we, we've focused through our initiative called Behind the Brands that some of you may have heard of on the food and beverage sector and the 10 largest global food and beverage companies. And we've done a, a lot of research over a period of about 18 months through which we sought to um, analyse their agricultural sourcing policies through a series of um, seven themes, seven lenses which we see as being critical to development. So that's um, women's rights, labour rights, land and water rights and usage, um, climate change um, policies and also the inclusion of smallholders in supply chains and finally transparency. And what we've done is we've sought through the Behind the Brands campaign to encourage these companies to implement new policies and um, that, that, that we see as having a, um, a broader impact than just on their own operations because obviously they then have influence down through their supply chains as, as Chris has already um, mentioned. And the way we've sought to do it is by using our network of supporters of Oxfam to engage with the companies um, and we're not kind of doing it through a consumer boycott, but more saying, you know, you enjoy the products that these companies make. Um, you also care about how they, they grow the ingredients that go into making these products. So come and join with us and let's try and build a race at the top and get these companies to, um, to improve the kind of policies that they've done. So, so I think the key elements of what we've done, we've built this database of um, indicators across these seven themes. Um, we've engaged with companies and um, we're, we're really seeking to see them move up um, the ranking because we've scored them on, on all these different themes. So we're just over a year into this initiative and we've been really pleased to see some significant movement by a number of the companies on a number of the issues, particularly land um, and women's rights. Um, but so we, we saw some, some great movement by Coke um, a few months ago on implementing free prior and informed consent as a principle into their own operations and down their supply chains, so requiring suppliers to adhere to that principle when they're involved in land acquisitions. And um, we, we, there's still some way to go and we're continuing to work and engage um, with these companies. Um, we've also seen a lot of interest from the investor community in this tool and this database of indicators. Um, they've, they've really welcomed the opportunity to see this analysis of companies' performance and to engage with us, with the companies, on these issues, which has been great. We've got an um, investor statement signed up to by about 33 investment houses um, supporting the initiative. And I think um, what we're seeing here is a, 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 an interesting combination of insider engagement with the companies by Oxfam um, and engagement on a more, from a more outsider perspective by, by it as well through trying to generate um, engagement of the company's consumers who recognise the brands. Um, so, so this perhaps goes a little bit against the grain of a lot of the discussion we've had today, that it's a, quite a critical engagement at one level and it's certainly not been overwhelmingly welcomed by all of the companies, but at the same time we do see that it's working, we've had a lot of traction and, um, and I think sometimes behind the scenes we've heard that companies have actually found it more helpful than they're certainly prepared to admit to us in terms of engaging stakeholders internally within a company on an issue and actually creating space for the people that are, are um, you know, really keen to make progress on these issues to, to, to achieve some, some movement. So that's, um, that's the main thing I wanted to, to work about. The, the one other thing that I thought it was useful to just um, to, to flag a bit, and it's come up a little bit before, um, is about the different roles, I think, of the different actors within the development space. So 
Oxfam is um, committed now to focus particularly on two main themes and to do that over a sustained period of time. And those themes are inequality and climate change, given that we see those as two of the biggest global threats to reducing poverty over time. So, um, and this seems to be a bit of a kind of common th thread that we see. Everybody's talking about inequality from, from the Pope to the World Bank, the IMF. Um, ourselves, Oxfam put out a report at the time of Davos and West's own report highlighted inequality is one of the biggest risks to, um, to global prosperity. Um, Oxfam highlighted the fact that, you know, the shocking fact really that 85 people own the same combined amount of wealth as the, the poorest um, half of the world's population. Really quite a shocking um, statistic. And many of you will have seen the recent IMF paper that, that was really showing the evidence of the importance of addressing inequality and um, not just looking at promoting economic growth because I think sometimes we've seen arguments that um, there are kind of conf there's a conflict between promoting some of the measures that need are needed to address inequality and some of the measures that are needed to address and promote economic growth. And um, I think rather there's a bit of an emerging consensus and evidence that these are two mutually supportive processes and we need to do both. So then it comes down to what are the roles of all the different actors involved across that that, that massive agenda and I guess it depends on what lens you're looking at things through so a lot of the discussion today has been focusing on the role of business um, and I, I, I thought John Humphrey's um, summary earlier was, was good there's the kind of core business thing of, of creating wealth and, and jobs there's the doing no harm part and then there's the efforts to, to do better as well but if you look at what's needed to achieve inclusive growth which I think is something that everybody's really interested in and if you take the issue of women's economic empowerment, for example, which is really at the heart of what Oxfam's trying to achieve, then it makes sense to start from the perspective of a woman and look at what it will take for her to achieve um, um, influence within the context of markets and it takes us into the realm of power in markets and a lot of issues that go way beyond the realm of economics um, and into the systems analysis we talked about there. So, so then we get into a very complex world of the different, many different levers and the many different roles that, 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 that each of us have and, and how we um, coordinate that to the best, um, the best outcome and I think this is somewhere where the idea and the new Business and Development Centre can really help um, with some thinking and some research into the different roles, um, priorities, sequencing, some of the issues that have already come up in the discussion today and also what good looks like. I think it, it, that there's a lot of convergence but there are also some very different priorities depending on which actors you're talking about. So, so, so let's be clear about what are our measures of success and um, you know, and, and who it makes sense to be, be looking at each of those and capturing the evidence that that's actually the direction that we're all that we're actually heading in. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Penny. That's, uh, in fact, I'm going to come back to everyone at the end to ask your views on what the, the new centre should do. But thanks for that for those uh, those words. I, I, I mean, as you described it yourself, a very constructive engagement that you've had with business. Um, I would guess that not everyone in the energy community uh, would share the view that you should engage with business at all, or as constructively as perhaps you do. Um, what do you say to your NGO colleagues about why you should engage with business at all? Well, I don't think anybody um, in the NGO community would argue against engaging with business, but it's more a question of what's the what's the value added as a civil society organisation that you can, you can bring to that. So. Um, Oxfam, we think we've always engaged constructively. Um, I think that there's a, there can be some quite different perspectives on what constructive engagement looks like. We've just done a review of our approach to, um, as Oxfam GB, of, of our private sector work and talked to a lot of um, companies that we've, we've, we've dealt with in different ways um, and, and broader external stakeholders. And um, where, where we've landed with that is that we will still potentially look to work with companies in a more collaborative way. We will still continue to challenge and do quite critical campaigning when necessary to get an issue onto the agenda or where we see real harm being done through poor practice. But I think the role we've defined for ourselves is that of a critical friend. Now, exactly what that looks like in practice is... Um, 
you know, it, it's challenging and it can be quite a tightrope walking mm-hmm. down that line. It involves a bit of insider and outsider <coughs> engagement. And I think our Behind the Brands campaign um, embodies that in a way, but it's not been a com- comfortable mm-hmm. journey for many of mm-hmm. the companies, I have to say. So, um, but that's, that's uh, I think a lot of companies have told us that's what they see um, that we can have the most um, value in doing. They've said it through gritted teeth sometimes, but mm-hmm. actually they, they have kind of that's come down on us in the end. Yeah. Well, we might come back to that in yeah. discussion. Um, Alex, let me turn to you. Um, In in a way, you work on what some would consider the holy grail of business development, and that is impact, Um, the the area of evaluating, demonstrating impact, and you do that for CDC's investments. Um, Can you say a bit more about what you do and and also how your thinking has evolved around, around impact? Yeah, uh, um, that would be great. So um, I think uh, this is my last opportunity to kind of talk a bit off the cuff before I go through the CDC media and public speaking course tomorrow morning at 9am. <laughs> so, so I'll start off, I'll, I'll take you back to 1948 in the Mexican Badlands. And so you've got Humphrey Bogart holed up with his money. And it, this is Treasurer of the Sierra Madre, if you've seen it. And um, so, and then Goldhat, who's the kind of chief baddie, pretending to be a federale. And um, he says, and so Bogart says, well, if you're the federalis, where are your badges? And Goldhat says, badges? I don't got no badges. I don't need no badges. I ain't going to show you no badges. Okay, so the analogy here, if you're wondering. <laughs> 1948. CDC was founded in 1948, so we 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 should be at retirement age if you know if you were allowed to retire at 67. We, but but no, we're going to carry on working. And the the in those days there were standards around, there were badges around. But but were we comfortable asking to see those badges from our investee companies? I I think it kind of took a long time for 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 organisations like CDC and other investors to get assertive (laughs) about what standards could be expected in emerging markets and and maybe the most progress has been made in the last 10 or maybe 15 years but probably the last 10 years so so the sort of standards I'm talking about are the same ones that John mentioned and um, that we've heard about from a number of others uh, social standards environmental standards but I, I do want to put on the table quality standards as the starting point and I, I, if people have said that already I apologize but I, I didn't hear it but I think I think for most companies the starting point is quality standards so it could, it could be ISO 19, uh, 9000 or it could be a, a, a different type of standard or it could be just a good management information system um, later on most companies then will come to a, to an environmental standard like um, ISO 14000 or, or the various um, sustainability initiatives and voluntary standards that we've heard about but but I think it's, it's incredibly important for a couple of reasons one um, to insist on these standards one is because um, companies with international certifications perform better than companies without and that is data from the World Bank doing business surveys based on in, um, developing countries so it's, this is not something that that is a European or North American obsession that doesn't really apply in our geographies and CDC by the way only invests in Africa and South Asia as of two years ago our new strategy so so the, 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 the evidence is that African and South Asian companies with internationally recognized quality standards perform better than those without. Um, so we think it's very important for a business performance point of view and we have to make a, a return on our investments. There's a requirement of the UK Treasury that we do that, therefore we, we have to be interested in that. We also think that it's an incredibly good way to have a serious discussion about other standards and particularly environmental and social standards um, and it's very hard to have that discussion if a company isn't committed to quality first. So so I'm, I'm, I, I don't know if this is a big innovation or not and it's certainly not a new new one but it's is something that I think um, there's a lot of progress can be made uh, I don't think this is just for the big companies like Olam um, or Anglo-American I think this this applies to even quite small companies and the evidence from China is that there's been a very rapid uptake on quality and um, if you like sustainability standards in companies of all sizes so I think that could apply um, the the 
difficulty, I think, in, in insisting on standards is um, that there isn't necessarily a relevant business case um, but the, um, from, from the markets that we're interested in. But there are a few, and it's nice to hear them. And it, it's nice to hear about Sad Miller, and it's nice, nice to hear about, um, about some of the other kind of well-known cases. I, I just want to very quickly mention one called NewPack in Madagascar. This is a company that was invested in primarily by um, INP Investments uh, in 2002, and the company, uh, I beg your pardon, in 2008, the company already had its ISO 9000, but it didn't have any, any sort of environmental or social standards. Uh, it would, already was very dominant in providing packaging to the, to the Madagascar market. I think they had 60% market share of packaging uh, with, with 250 clients. So it was a successful company. Um, however, the investors uh, recognized that uh, without environmental and social standards, there, there would be a limit on the growth of the company. And they, they worked hard with the company to, 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 to bring in a social and environmental management system. The company did that at the same time that won a contract from a major exporter from Madagascar, um, which became one of their top 10 customers overnight. Uh, and the company now has got 250 employees. It's a, you know, it's a real win-win story there with a kind of hands-on but not overly interfering role from the investment um, team, um, very strong ownership from the company management team, and very nice financial results to go with improved um, environmental and social. Um, and I think the case study is published by MPEA, which is the Emerging Markets Private Equity Association. So it's it's only four pages. It's a good read. Um, so so that was my that was my example. Very briefly, um, what does CDC do to kind of to to kind of take this good advice? Um, the recent investments that we've made, one in an African uh, palm oil um, uh, operation where we have strongly encouraged them to go into the RSPO, the Re Round Table on um, Responsible, Round Table on Responsible Palm Oil, RSPO. Um, and I think we'll, you know, they, they will be joining the August Company of Olam and others in doing that. But uh, this, you know, this hasn't been seen as an African-led initiative until quite recently, I would say, you know, more Indonesian in some ways. Uh, but I think it's really important for African companies to, to fully participate and own the process. Um, another example, um, an Indian um, apparel company, uh, we are strongly encouraging them to look at the ethical trading initiative. And if they do that, they would be the first Indian company selling products to Indian consumers, clothing products to Indian consumers, to go down that route. It wouldn't tackle the China question that we heard about earlier, but it would certainly tackle the um, Indian consumer um, challenge. And it is not the case that Indian consumers don't care about these things. They have a lot of other preoccupations <laughs> and maybe the level of penetration isn't quite as high as it is in Europe, but there certainly is an audience for, and there is a conceivable market advantage to companies that, that can sign up to global best practices. So, so that's, the, that's the kind of the good bit. The, the challenge, I think, is, you know, I look at the room and I think about um, Shankar's point about um, informalization, and I think, uh, you know, if this was an African country, then only the people on this table here would have formal jobs, and everybody else in the room would have informal jobs. And they'd be insecure, they'd be badly paid, there'd be low health and safety standards, and you wouldn't know where next, money, next month's money was coming from. And you guys would be quite well sorted, but the trouble is, you'll be growing like maybe one person every three years, and the rest of the room would be growing 10% every two years. So the, the, the share of the formal sector in Africa is getting smaller. <coughs> Even if even if it's it, it's continuing to create jobs, it's not doing it fast enough. So the African countries are becoming more informal, <coughs> and some bits of India, it's the same thing. So so formal jobs are incredibly important, and the membrane in an economy between the informal sector and the formal sector is a membrane that's becoming harder to cross. And some people, in fact, are going the wrong direction. They're, they're becoming less formal in terms of their, their livelihoods. And so I, 
I do think this is very important, and I think it's important for investors like CDC to be aware of who gets the jobs that we create. So it's it's fine to create jobs, and, and as, as Secretary of State says, our shareholder says, you know, it's all about the jobs. It, it, it definitely is all about the jobs. They also have to be decent jobs and sustainable jobs, absolutely. But you also have to be really thoughtful about who is getting them, who isn't getting them. And I think the, the key for, for people like CDC, while we, while we try to create as many formal sector jobs as we possibly can, it's not many in the grand scheme of things in the African context, but there is, for every investment we make, there is a big supply chain. Half of it could be informal. Um, I, can, I fully recognize the point about the kind of, you know, some of these supply chains with millions of people in them. Are you keeping those people informal, or do some of them have an escape route into formality? It's really important to focus on that. And I think with my, mm -hmm. I'm going to leave the 50, other 50 seconds for Alistair and mm -hmm. stop on that point. Thank Great. you. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, thanks, Alice. I mean, you're clearly thinking about impact and asking for badges, as your analogy. Um, is that a trend amongst uh, other investors? And what would, your, uh, what would you say to, say, the more commercial uh, or other commercial investors and, um, uh, and DFIs in, in this space around, around measuring impact and demonstrating it? I think it's a really good point. I think, um, you know, everybody's an impact investor these days. Um, uh, so certainly a lot of um, Indian um, general partners talk about themselves as being impact investors, African, African venture capitalists as well, private equity. So, so I think there's a big discussion about impact. I think the, um, a lot of people um, kind of uh, don't necessarily get in early enough in the discussion to, to kind of get the leverage they could have. So, you know, I think there's a sort of conception that, that if you take a stake in a company, you, you can sort of dictate all sorts of things and find out all sorts of stuff. I, I hear a lot of people kind of A, saying, no, no, you know, it's not, um, it's not for us to ask this stuff. It's too much. It's a burden on the company. I would say, you know, it's not too much to ask for, for basic information that, in fact, is basic management information that most competent companies should have at the press of a button these days. Um, and so, you know, companies that say they don't have jobs numbers or uh, uh, investment partners that say that it's not fair to ask for job numbers, this is, you know, this is nonsense. Companies mm. should know how many people they employ these days. Mm. Um, so I think that, I think then, on the other hand, um, it's never too early in the conversation to <coughs> make your data demands and your expectations about international standards known, um, and that it's amazing how the window of influence closes down once a deal's done. Um, and so the sweet sweet moment is in the run-up to a deal, and then if you suddenly think, damn, I should have asked about RSPO, uh, <laughs> it's amazing how people don't want to reopen the legal negotiations after they've, they've kind of worked 48 hours on the trot to sign something. So I think get it in early, but yeah. don't be too modest in what you ask yeah. for when, as long as you do it early. Thank you. Great advice. Um, finally, Alistair, let me move to you. You're the head of a department focused on the private sector in a donor that has, I would say, it's fair to say, been a leader for many years in this space. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how DFID's thinking has evolved on, on, the space, on the space of business and development? Sure. I should uh, preface my remarks by saying that I did the DFID public speaking course some years ago, so you are doomed to a dry, uh, uninteresting and humorless presentation. Um, and I haven't got quite as interesting a DVD collection as, as Alex has. In fact, um, the last time I went to the cinema, I saw The Wolf of Wall Street, and I was trying to work out if there was something I could extrapolate from that film to bring to this discussion. Uh, I can assure you that life in 22 Whitehall bears no resemblance to that, that film, in case you were wondering. Um, so, I, I mean, I can talk a little bit about how Diffid's thinking on this um, has evolved, um, but I'm assuming, sort of having looked at the guest list and seeing some familiar faces around, that um, several of you will have uh, read uh, Justine Greening's speeches, the one that she made uh, at the London Stock Exchange uh, about six weeks ago, the one that she made there last year, um, and some of you with longer memories uh, will remember um, uh, Andrew Mitchell's views on uh, why DFID should do more to support the private sector, which led to a complete change in uh, CDC's strategy. I think our thinking is continuing to evolve, um, and uh, without wanting to uh, leave myself to be pressed into a corner at the drinks reception afterwards, um, we are open to influence um, because we don't uh, <laughs> pretend to have all the answers yet. And um, to the extent that this event uh, reflects 
um, the bringing to bear of some serious uh, academic credibility on the evidence base for the things that we're doing, we very much welcome that. Um, we think it's important that NGOs have their views, uh, we will have our views within government, DFIs will be focused on their operational targets and what they need uh, to know to deliver those things, but um, uh, there's nothing quite like the completely dispassionate analysis that comes from uh, academic evidence gathering to, to, to tell us, particularly uh, over a longer time period whether something is working or not and to explode our, uh, our preconceived ideas and our, our prejudices. I'm, I'm very conscious that people who work in government um, uh, have a tendency to drift into um, uh, policy-based evidence making which is not a healthy healthy place to be. <laughs> um, so uh, in terms of um, how our thinking is continuing to evolve. I, I think um, if, if, if time is short, and I'm conscious that you want to um, come to the questions that are uh, lurking on the tables, um, I, I think I would just refer you to the to the document that we that we published on our website at the end of January, which is called our Economic Development Strategic Framework, which is not just about working with business, but it sets out the areas where we think uh, DFID and the UK government should do more uh, to promote economic development and that benefits poor people in the developing world um, and you'll see that we've called it a framework and not a strategy because we have not finalized uh, our thinking and um, I'm, I'm interested to to hear constructive critiques um, from people in the room as to whether you think there are other things we can do it's very kind of you to say that we've been a, um, a, a thought leader in this field but we, we want to continue to to be so um, I, uh, as a civil servant, uh, made the mistake of responding to the brief that I was given for this event. I don't know if I'm allowed still to do that or whether you want to uh, go, go all Paxman on again. me and start yeah, asking yeah. me um, uh, other questions. I, I, as a civil servant, I also immediately found a drafting error which I wanted to correct in the first <laughs> sentence, uh, which, which, which says, what's the UK experience of making business work for development? And I think our fundamental approach is that nobody makes business do anything. We incentivize business at the margins to make slightly different decisions to the ones that they might otherwise have made. Um, if business leaders come along with a different world view and want to contribute to double, triple, quadruple bottom lines, um, then that's great. But um, I think we need to be uh, uh, as a donor or as an NGO um, appropriately modest about what we can make business do which is um, very little of course um, uh, uh, developing country governments can make businesses do things by passing laws and regulating them in particular ways and they do that sometimes advisedly and sometimes ill-advisedly in terms of uh, deterring them rather than attracting them um, so in terms of uh, the UK experience of incentivizing um, business to work uh, better for development. I just wanted to give my one example, as we all seem to be in, uh, look where I come from, I've got a good example to showcase, which is what we were, we were invited to do, um, which is the Private Infrastructure Development Group, which um, some of you may be familiar with, a, a multi-donor initiative that DFID was involved in setting up about 12 years ago, uh, which uh, brings together nine donors who use some public money, um, uh, some of it uh, returnable capital rather than grant funding, um, to try and uh, leverage um, private investment into infrastructure which benefits poor people in developing countries. Some elements of its work is not dissimilar to what CDC and other DFIs do, but it's a slightly different uh, business model. Um, we think it's been a great success. Um, uh, donors have put in uh, about $760 million of money over the last 12 years um, and leveraged about $10 billion of private investment. Um, and one of the things that we need to be very conscious of, I think, um, as ODA becomes increasingly irrelevant um, as a total percentage of financial flows into developing countries is how we use our money to affect the other money that is or isn't flowing, um, not just try and buy the best possible results uh, that we can with the money um, that we have. But we're not just interested in financial flows, uh, we're also interested in causal chains to poor people and how poor people benefit um, and the investments that the private infrastructure development group has made um, have delivered uh, infrastructure services to about 60 million uh, people, most of them, although not all of them, uh, poor, and about another 40 million people have benefited from improved services uh, as a result of its investments. That's about 100 million people, most of them poor, benefiting from investment, which is largely coming from the private sector, but we hope uh, would not have happened, uh, I say we hope, because we, we have to claim additionality um, for, for what we do with our money uh, without um, donor involvement, and about 185,000 jobs have been uh, created along the way, and I think we all need to 
to recognise that um, infrastructure um, uh, is an enabler, but it also um, uh, creates an awful lot of jobs because it's quite labour intensive, and we're all looking for the kind of job creation which benefits poor people, particularly unskilled uh, poor people. So the reason I think that's a good example, sort of stepping back from the particular uh, detail of that case. Um, it's an example of using public money to leverage private investment. Um, uh, that's what CDC does. Um, that's what DFIs do. Lots of people are engaged in that uh, line of work. I, I, I'm slightly resistant to the school of thought, which I hear quite often, where people say, oh, you know, AD is completely relevant because business is so huge and they'll make their own decisions about what they're going to do in developing countries and the real smart money is on trying to influence them and, you know, regulating and having good standards, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is nonsense. Um, uh, several of the organisations who we work with who are large and profitable freely admit that without money that we make available to them, they would not do some of the most interesting things that they do from a development perspective and we need to tread a quite careful line um, in how we use the um, hard-pressed UK taxpayers money um, but I strongly believe that using that money to leverage um, larger amounts of private investment um, is uh, something the UK taxpayer should feel happy about. Um, secondly I think it's a good example um, because uh, infrastructure, which is the output of this um, facility, is such a key constraint to any kind of business activity or economic growth in developing countries. Um, we all know that very well, but people sometimes, I think, lose sight of it. And um, I, I certainly feel coming back to the UK after um, eight and a half years out of it, um, most of it in developing countries, that the debate in the UK about what developing countries really need remains a bit out of touch with what um, people in developing countries uh, including uh, uh, elected politicians in developing countries actually say they don't want us to invest all our money in health and education and humanitarian aid. They want us to invest in things which are going to improve their ability to trade their way out of poverty and they see investment in infrastructure as absolutely critical to that. So we are responding to fairly strong messages, I think, um, from uh, key people, uh, including poor people in developing countries, um, as to what's really necessary. And uh, of all the different things that infrastructure can invest in, that the private infrastructure development group has invested in, the CDC has invested in as well, I would highlight two which I think are of enormous impact, which are power. Uh, and mobile telephony. Mobile telephony, none of us could have foreseen 20 years ago how that has revolutionised poor people's lives. It has not become the tool of the middle classes, um, which poor people don't benefit from. It has opened up so many different opportunities for poor people. I've just come back from four and a half years in Kenya, which is kind of the capital of innovation in the use of mobile phones for poor people, so maybe I would say that. But um, those are investments in a lot of developing countries that were facilitated by uh, the Private Infrastructure Development Group and CDC um, ahead of the market markets, uh, interest or ability in investing in those countries. Um, power, I, I, I just don't see that large numbers of um, industries, and particularly manufacturing industries, are going to expand very quickly in developing countries unless um, there's a massive increase in power investment, and um, certainly it's, it's uh, my government's view that that should not primarily come from the public sector, it needs to come from the private sector. And lastly, my, um, uh, the reason why I think that the Private Infrastructure Development Group is an important example is because it focuses on poverty and it focuses on results and it measures the results that it achieves. And I think coming back to the role um, of this new centre, uh, improving best practice, contributing to the existing debates that are happening across the world and how to measure impact on poverty from business engagement is, is, is absolutely critical. Um, I haven't got more than, I think, one second left, so the, um, the, the, the key change I would say is needed, and um, I'm afraid I haven't been here all day, so I don't know how much people have really spoken about this, what, what, what's needed to um, uh, really change the way in which business works for development, I, I think it's helping developing country governments to incentivise business to contribute um, to development. There's lots of survey data that tells us um, that the investment climate is the key constraint to business growth and that applies to international and domestic business and we shouldn't lose sight of the absolutely critical role that domestic businesses play in developing countries in, in, in creating jobs and they don't just have to be parasitic or suppliers um, to international businesses. Um, the regulatory regime that these countries put in place to protect their own citizens and protect their own interests, particularly from companies who who are uh, extracting things um, from the country is absolutely key and we all know that um, a lot of developing country governments do not have the capacity to play that game which is often a very high stakes legal game 
to, in quite the right way. Um, and the other thing I would really highlight um, is the ability of uh, successful economic growth to contribute to tax collection. Um, and uh, it's certainly my Secretary of State's view that increasingly the health and education services in developing countries that have for too long perhaps been subsidised by foreign taxpayers should be financed um, by domestic revenue collection. Um, and one of the things we track with the Private Infrastructure Development Group is how much money the companies which it supports pay in taxes um, and, and other fees to governments, about $3 billion so far since it was created. Um, this ties very much with um, uh, David Cameron's G8 agenda on tax. Um, the, uh, the role of business is not just to um, improve supply chains, create jobs, contribute to economic growth, it's to finance basic government services. Of course, there's a lot of causal chains there between the tax being collected and it being spent on useful things which actually benefit poor people, but we're working on all of that too. So I think it, we should never lose sight of um, the absolutely critical role that donors have in supporting developing country governments to get the climate right for businesses to invest and to invest in ways which benefit poor people in developing countries. Mm. Thanks. Thank you, Alistair. Um, in fact, I don't know if you were here when one of the comments in the audience was around some of these systemic issues. And um, well, I mean, one thing I've noticed uh, as an observer to DFID for a number of years is uh, what appears to be a shift away from supporting specific, say, inclusive business models to looking at more systemic impacts. Is that a fair summary? And I guess this explains why that shift is happening. Well, I heard one comment in the last session about uh, firm-level interventions versus uh, market-level interventions or system-level interventions, and, and there's obviously a, an active debate amongst those who are involved in the making markets work for the poor community um, about uh, how best to do that, and I think in some of the work that we support, including um, the Business Innovation Facility, which I think my colleague Laura referred to and some of you will be familiar with, we have taken that on board and we have responded to that shift. Um, more broadly, I think we, um, you know, we need to think of ourselves uh, as a donor, not just as a supporter of individual interventions, um, but as a uh, critical friend, if I can use um, Penny's phrase in a, in a different context, uh, to developing country governments about what the uh, constraints are um, to uh, economic development which will benefit poor people, and that should push us to doing more systemic analysis. Um, and that, I think, highlights my, my, my last point. Um, innovations, good initiatives, working out how to take them to scale is all great, um, but if actually the fundamental constraints to those things happening are um, uh, bad laws, lousy regulation, uh, lack of capacity in relevant bits of government, um, then you know it's a systemic intervention to try and address those things. The problem is that those constraints have often got some complex bit of political economy mixed in with them somewhere where somebody is benefiting from something which is suboptimal for the country as a whole, and we need to think smart and um, um, perhaps if there is a sort of a community of interests between businesses investing in developing countries, NGOs, donors who all want to see this virtuous circle of inclusive economic growth that benefits poor people, we can help policy makers and reformers in developing countries who need to sometimes have a bit more courage to address those vested interests that stop those reforms happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to open up now to... The audience. Uh, we've got uh, about 10 minutes. Uh, I've been given license to roam for an extra 10 minutes, though, if, uh, if there's uh, agreement to that. Um, so uh, let's see how we go. So if I could take questions in threes. Um, and what we're going to do, actually, is I'm going to ask the panellists to respond to any of the questions they want to, but not all of them necessarily, just so we can get through as many as we can. Um, so microphone. Yeah. It's Christian here. I, I just was very interested about uh, what Chris said around getting funding from development institutions, and, and you mentioned a lot of them. Uh, we also, within our strategy, see that as a massive opportunity. And I was wondering, is, is that financing critical for your business? Is, is a, as a big proportion? What happens if you don't get it? Um, just to have an idea of the strategic value of, of that finance. Thank you. Lady right at the back.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm from the Enterprise Training and Knowledge Group. Um, my question is actually to Alex. You said that um, the CDC typically would like to invest in companies who have certain standards, such as ISO and the rest of them. Um, it actually costs quite a bit to initiate and implement these kind of programs within organizations, especially in emerging economies. Um, my question is, how, many, how does this affect the size of your pipeline businesses that you invest in? And are there any in interventions or programs or plans or strategies that you put in place so that viable businesses don't, you know, like um, miss out on this very much needed funding? Thank you. Um, Roger Oakley, Springfield Centre. Just to, just to add to Christian's question, really, um, is if I'm a a, a medium-sized agribusiness firm in Bangladesh, how do I replicate what you're doing if you are getting these sources of soft funding grants, whatever it is, um, where do I go with that if I've only got the commercial banking sector to turn to? Great. Um, I'm just going to pause there for a second just to get some immediate reflections. Um, Chris, first question was directed, I think. Um, two, I Shall I answer them? But the two. Yeah. This is all about funding. Um, firstly, it's an interesting question, is it critical? In the majority of cases, we're talking about funding processing units, maybe $20 million, $15 million, some of that, right? I wouldn't say that was critical to us, but we got some other parts of our business which are very large scale, and I would say that funding was more critical. The commercial banks are interested, but they're not, you know, we could go for the push commercial bank route. I like going with the DFI funding from the point of view that there is less reputation you know, there's a good reputation for us to work with DFIs, number one. But also, number two, the DFIs look at the opportunity of putting grant money through that loan into the supply chain. So for me, there's, a, there's the benefit where you get that grant money. But to the other point on funding, um, is it Roger, isn't it? Uh, you'll be surprised to know that the DFI funding is the same cost as a commercial bank. But the time horizon of a DFI is different. So some commercial banks get concerned about investing something like a, a, pro, a project which could take five years before it starts generating cash, whereas a DFI goes with the flow a lot more. So there's, there's spins and roundabouts. But I would stress to you that the cost of working with a DFI would be higher than working with a commercial bank from a company point of view, purely because of the reporting requirements, and I'm going to use the word compliance. You know, I, I think it's, I'm going to use the expression good housekeeping for us, because we've raised our standards on labour, environmental management, it's good, but there's an incentive for us to raise those standards because of that DFI funding. And we have to regularly report to the DFI progress. So there's an annual monitoring report based on what they call, the, all the expressions come out, the ESAP, the Environmental Social Action Plan. I'm sure the CDC you know about it. So, you know, on those sleepless nights when you've signed the line, then you've taken on the actual action plan that you are going to have to do over a defined period of time. So there could be an investment cost to develop those management systems and structures reporting, but also to upgrade your health and safety. You know, to really invest in capacity building. So there is costs associated with it as well. But it's, it's a, it's a, it's a catch-22 in some ways. But I'm in favour of it because of the extra benefit it brings as well. So I think those are the two that were... Thank you. Come to me. All right, so I'm jump in there. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry I didn't, um, didn't catch your name from the, the Enterprise Training Group, but this, this thing about the um, costliness of, 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 of standards. So I think um, yeah, a couple of observations. One is, one is that, yes, it is, it is it's mainly the time, in fact, I think, um, with most of these standards. And the, uh, so, so a big company doesn't necessarily have an advantage because it's going to chew up a lot of time, whatever size you are but I think um, ISO in particular you know they're quite commercial so they they don't want to exclude a lucrative market in SMEs and they have you know they have taken some considerable efforts to to kind of make the process doable for SMEs uh, probably not informal sector but formal sector um, and I, you know I think uh, you, you're going to need sort of somebody to own this so if you're a five person firm and everyone's flat out it's going to be really tough to get one of these international badges the um, 
on the other hand, we're kind of pragmatic insofar as you know what we what we want to see is actually kind of real progress and really good systems. And so, an, an internally generated system is worth as much to to a lot of investors as as some sort of international trophy to go in the in the kind of lobby uh, of your of your of your your building. Much as managers love to have those kind of glass bauble things. Um, so, so I think that's one thing. The other thing is that um, it's our understanding of the the um, um, the, the the kind of job creation potential of the private sector is that um, fifty percent of the jobs are created by big businesses and fifty percent of the jobs are created by SMEs and so we, we're actually quite agnostic about the size of firms that we invest in because the best evidence we get from academics is that it's fifty fifty so in a way it's not very helpful and it might be very helpful for people like IDS to kind of sharpen up that analysis a bit which is I'd say still quite rudimentary uh, literature on you know where jobs are created in Africa and South Asia, but the, the best literature available, the way I read it, is it's kind of 50-50. So so we, we'll back SMEs and large businesses. If it's if it's coming from the London in our direct investment strategy, it's very tough for us to, to take stakes in small businesses. It, you know it costs more you know to fly from London to to visit the company to attend a board meeting than could be justified, which is why we we can continue with our fund of funds model to get closer to small and medium businesses. Um, on the other hand, uh, you, you can probably go on a more exciting journey if you have a decent stake in a big business and you can get on the board and, and work kind of actively, much as uh, people like Olam may not relish all the attention that the DFIs give them, um, you know, you, you can certainly achieve a lot. So I think that's a kind of long way of saying um, it's not really about the cost of the standards, there's, there's a lot of other factors driving what sort sorts of sizes of businesses we invest in but the standards you know it's not just for window dressing that's that would be a waste of money um, but I think most standards people now are aware that they need to make these things accessible to SMEs mm. thank you Next, you want to jump in I might go back to the okay um, yeah let's take three more questions okay. Jerry here Thanks. This uh, really is a question for Alistair. Can you, say, um, can you say where you're from as well, please? Sorry, uh, Jerry Ball from Care International. Um, I, I, the economic development, the st new strategic framework, um, and Justine Greeny's speech announced that there was going to be substantially more DFID investment in that area. And I wondered if that uh, responds to um, high levels of, as it were, on the ground demand within the countries which you're currently working, or whether you're taking a more strategic view, but part of that is that you're actually almost going to have to create that demand or create the number of opportunities in your deal pipeline, the number of things that are coming to you with, with private sector involvement. Thanks. Uh, Elise Walk with the Institute of Development Studies. This is a question for Chris, and I really appreciated the um, extent to which Olam is sourcing from smallholder farmers. And I wondered if you might be able to speak to the extent to which Olam is knowledgeable about the poverty levels of those farmers, either um, when they begin working with Olam and whether they, that poverty level changes over time. Thank you. So, Caroline, on this side. Thank you, Caroline Ashley. I get the sense we're coming to a lot of uh, to the end of a long day. Where there's been a lot of agreement, a lot of nodding. So let me ask, what do you disagree with? Or you probably won't say because you will speak on behalf of companies and charities and government. But at least, where might we go wrong? What are the tensions? What should we avoid? I'm hearing us actually talking about some quite different things. Are we looking for jobs? Are we looking for innovation? Are we looking for impact actually on poor people? Direct impact, causal linkages, some criticism of companies being a critical friend. Beneath the surface, I can see we're talking about some different things, but we're not being very upfront about what are the risks for all of us in the terrain ahead and where might we end up in different places? Thank you, good question. Um, come back to the floor in a second. Uh, Penny, do you want to make that last point that was interesting about uh, what's below the surface? <laughs> what's, behind, what's behind the brand? <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> I think 
think there are um, a lot of differences. Some of, it, some of it has come out through some of the discussion today, Caroline, but I think um, I think certainly on the table discussion I was part of earlier and some of the questions Oxfam would, would raise, we are interested in impacts on, on people living in poverty, and I guess um, there are lots of questions about the use of UK taxpayers' money to leverage or... Um, encourage private sector investment. Um, I think I think we're still learning um, how effective that can be. Where what, you know which sectors and, and areas and, and kinds of com companies it should be um, focused on, and to what extent this is a uh, an area we should really prioritise over some some other areas. Because um, I think from a lot of the points that have been raised about um, what what matters for, for, for poverty reduction and development, if you put the development before the business in this this whole discussion, um, then 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 you need to be looking at some of the issues that go beyond numbers of jobs important as they may be and, and really looking at quality of jobs and, and who gets those jobs. So um, I, I appreciate and, and you know better than most Caroline how difficult it can be to get to the heart of that and, and monitor and mo monitor that in practice and develop the right indicators to really look at that. But I think these are some of the questions um, that have yet to be proven and, and I think there's a number of, of, um, of people in, that, that would just want to express a, a note of caution in terms of how much we shift direction wholly um, or, or primarily on, on to, onto using public money development finance for um, leveraging private sector development and look at the opportunity cost of that or at least to tread quite carefully until we gather more of the evidence as to what works and what's, what's really working well. So that's what, definitely one, one big area. I guess the other main point, and it, it, it links to it, is I think there must be some tensions. Maybe this is another thing that IDS could, could helpfully look at between... Um, between some of the standards that might be needed to um, protect rights and um, help ensure that um, poor communities benefit from some of these investments and some of the measures that, that might be um, considered to be unhelpful in the enabling environment. So, uh, you know, more of a de deregulatory approach. I think there's a real tension there that um, that can exist. And I think, more, I mean, I think there's been some research done looking at the types of policies, government policies and regulation that's needed and, and their effective implementation. But that's another area that I think is um, is perhaps quite contentious. Thank you, Asta. Couple, one question directed at you, but I was interested to hear your response to Caroline's challenge. Sure, um, and, and maybe Annie's response as well. Um, so, in answer to Jerry's question, uh, if, if your question is about uh, um, uh, policymakers in developing countries, yes, they would like uh, DFID to invest more in economic development. If your question is about DFID staff in developing countries, then. Um, no, it's not about it. are the, are the you know, already lots of businesses like that, you know, lots of business opportunities as well where this investment would go. So you're responding to your increased investment in that area is responding to that right? Um, no, I don't think that's the primary driver. And uh, you know, I think we need to be clear that um, our mandate is poverty reduction, not increase in business activity. We see the latter as a means to the former end. Um, I mean, I can say a little bit more about uh, what, what, what we hear from uh, from from developing country governments, if you're if you're interested. I, I mean, I think in answer to Caroline's question, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a kind of intellectually competitive kind of guy, and I, when I took this job, I thought I was going to get involved in some really bloody ideological arguments. And seven months in, I'm a little bit disappointed because I keep coming to events like this where everyone keeps agreeing with each other, um, or at least um, the the disagreements are at the margins, or politely put, or or both. Um, I uh, was invited by by Penny's boss, Mark Goldring, to, to, to go to a dinner as part of um, Oxfam's review of its private sector work, um, where I was really an observer, I think, because it was largely people from business and people from other NGOs. And Mark's dilemma was, um, uh, you know, on the one hand, um, we're doing a partnership with Marks and Spencers on swapping um, uh, during uh, the day. And then uh, the next morning, I'm on the radio doing uh, behind the brands and slagging off some large multinational. And um, at its 
most awkward and embarrassing. I might be um, uh, have one set of staff having a partnership with a company, and then uh, and then the um, policy campaigns advocacy people tell me to, to to slag them off. Uh, you know, the same day. Um, you know, how does an NGO reconcile those th those different positions? Um, and and we had a very nice um, dinner at a very uh, right on restaurant in Clerkenwell, and and I think you know everybody around the table was sort of at the progressive centre of their sectors. Uh, space, so we, you know, we had nice people from SAB Miller and the co-op, and, and they were all yes. We have to think about sustainability in the future, and you know, think about the impact of uh, our activities on the countries and the pe poor people in places where we work. And we had a bunch of NGOs who, whatever campaigning work they might do, are forming partnerships um, with, with with private sector companies and, and very successful and influential ones. Um, and I, I sort of sat there and listened to these people, sort of mostly all agreeing with each other, and and thought, you know, wouldn't it be much more interesting if you had somebody from McDonald's and some from the World Development movement sitting here I mean, you'd have a very different conversation and I think in terms of um, uh, what you know what the, the positive outlook on what we might be doing here is that we are building up the evidence base at the sensible sustainable sort of consensual center of the interaction between our different sectors um, and uh, as we build up that evidence base the sort of prejudice still informed ideological snipers from uh, whatever side may find it more and more difficult to do anything but be ideological that's a you know i think that's a sort of good long term story about you know what we're doing um, uh, at its worst this is sort of a cozy conversation between people who will agree with each other and there's a whole other set of worlds out there with quite a lot of money um, doing very different things and Oxfam and others may be campaigning against those uh, th those people but they you know they're not going to be reading the um, the, the academic uh, Research outputs of uh, of IDS, or um, uh, coming and knocking on Diffid's door and saying, "How can we work with you more on standards?" Um, so it feels to me that you've got to take quite a long-term view of what's going on here. And when I look at the evidence base that my staff put to me of the things that they want me to sign off on that we should do, and I compare it to the evidence base that was put to me on what we should do on malaria in Kenya, it's in its infancy. The evidence base is weak. Um, but it takes years to build up a good evidence base if you're doing it properly and you know, you're doing randomized control trials and you're um, you know, really trying to trace through uh, you know, proper causal chains as to what works and what doesn't work. Um, so it's going to take us a while to build this up. And as we do, um, everybody should have the courage um, to go and work with more difficult partners who don't come to events like this. I, I applaud Oxfam and other NGOs for continuing to campaign against what they see as the, um, the worst excesses. I'm not so keen on Penny's sort of implicit, dare I say, conservative with a small c message that we should tread very, very carefully because this is not yet proven. I think, to go back to Jerry's point, we have a very strong message, not just from poor people, but from business leaders and from democratic, democratically elected politicians in developing countries that they want us to help their economies grow in ways which benefit poor people. And we don't just do that by investing in health and education. Um, so if Penny wants a good argument about that proposition, I'd be happy to uh, you know, get a bit more argumentative. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Alistair. I'm afraid we have uh, come to the end. Apologies to those who wanted to ask a question and, and didn't get a chance. I was going to ask, there's one question pending at the back which is directed to me. Should we, we'll talk about it afterwards. Is that okay? Yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Yeah, right. If I could just use the last minute Sorry. just to ask you to say in a few seconds your headline message to the Business Development Centre in terms of where they should focus. Me starting? Yeah, me starting. Right, I was going to uh, talk about a bit of this with, with, uh, on Caroline's point, so very quickly. There is a growing concern in the business area, of course, of like what is pre-competitive. You know, I think this is such an important issue because when you say the private sector, you really bucket us all together. You know, we are a, a lot of competition. You know, there's a lot of different parts in supply chains and so on. So my key message is really look at what is a pre-competitive issue to discuss. And then the other thing is, is that look at models that work. And there's an increasing um, interest in models of matching funding with donors because you, we've got the IDH. Uh, Dutch Sustainable Trade Initiative, which has come out of the, uh, the IDH, uh, is where they're doing matching grants. So, you know, business and, and grants, those kind of things are becoming good models for us to work with. But what's effective in that? I think there's a lot of research that needs to look in that, into that as well. Is it good use of public money? And the last point is, is transparency, I agree, is critical. 
but we're a supply chain company where knowledge to us is very important. So you've got this point of public investment for public goods. So if we take money on certain issues and it has to get publicly reported back, you know, we don't go to a Nestle or a Unilever and ask them, you know, the detail of how they market a product. So it's quite imposing on us when we get asked what is the detail of a certain part of a supply chain in a certain country. So there's got to be some sort of sensitivity there because that's what we've invested in for years and built that business. So there's quite an intrusion into business as well. And I'm not just saying that in a way of anti-transparency. I'm just saying it, it's a point to really overcome. Okay. Okay. Benny. So um, I guess it's just the, the main thing I would say is that I think I think there is a lot of work to be done on building the evidence base for what works. I think it's um, I'd encourage IDS to really um, look at the you know look look at this from the the, the development end and and we can see see how we can, what what are the key issues we really want to focus on what do we really want to be measuring here and how quickly can we really start to build some evidence on you know one or two priority areas and really see what's working and what what might not be working and hopefully we can um, speed up this learning curve and really work out where we can be putting our efforts. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, I, there's so, so many things have been asked of you. I mean, I, without knowing how big the centre is going to be and everything, I, I kind of shudder to add any more tasks. But from, you know, from, from our point of view, I think to, to kind of focus on, on, on domestic companies rather than kind of um, high-performing global corporations, um, you know, directly contradicting for once Chris's plea with Olam, but sort of think, think about the kind of typical business rather than the exceptions and maybe focus on this kind of nexus between the formal and informal sector and how people get across it in the right direction um, that 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 certainly would be directly useful to 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 all of the companies we work with mm -hmm. thank you Master. Well, I, I agree with Alex on uh, focusing on the domestic and not just the multinationals and I agree with with Penny that sort of you know the basic proposition is help us all rise up the learning curve a bit faster um, where possible. I mean I've, I've looked at this leaflet which we all got in our in our packs and sounds pretty good to me. I think the challenge for the centre um, really is about um, it, it is to apply um, the impact methodology um, uh, discipline to its own work. So how are you going to change the world as a result of doing all this stuff um, if you're just going to feed it to the true believers, the people in this room, the people who are already engaged in this space? At the margins, you'll change our behaviour a little bit. But I'd be interested to know what your outreach strategy is going to be um, to uh, businesses, um, policy makers who don't come to events like this, who don't follow these debates, who are in significant positions of commercial or political authority in developing countries uh, and in uh, developed countries. Um, and how are you going to boil down what may be academic research, which is hard for those people to digest, into key messages that will change their investment decisions change their political judgments um, about things that they should do and hopefully although they might not might not necessarily be motivated by poverty reduction in ways that will have a, a, an impact on poor people's lives so i'd be interested to know what you're going to do with what you find out not just what you do thank you very much well that brings us to the end unfortunately but i'd uh, like to thank everyone for participating in a very estimating discussion thank you um, I've uh, got the great, the great pleasure now of introducing uh, Melissa Leach, who is the IDS Incoming Director, to say a few words. Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Melissa. As has been said, I'm going to be um, the overall director of IDS from next month. Not quite in that position yet, but exciting times ahead. And a particularly exciting set of debates, I think, um, to be had around this emerging Centre for Business and Development. And I've got the rather difficult task of kind of offering some concluding themes and thoughts around what has been an incredibly rich afternoon, I think. Um, so there were just a few things I wanted to flag and then some hopes for what I hope this centre might be able to do for us. So, I mean, 
mean, I approach this actually not as somebody who's worked very strongly in the business and development field, um, and a little bit as an observer from the outside, but as somebody who has worked over many, many years on very grassroots issues with poor people, mostly in African contexts, um, and around questions of sustainability and rights and gender. And my first observation, really, I think it's come through implicitly from all of this discussion, is that the context in which we're having this debate is one that's very different from some of the old aid agendas. We're not just in a world where, as has been discussed, um, finance and, and business investments are now dwarfing um, official development assistance, but we're also no longer in a country where, the, in a context where those old divisions between North and South really make any sense. As has emerged this afternoon, um, questions of um, global responsibility to, to meet sustainability goals, to steer within what's being talked about as planetary boundaries, to address the challenges of climate change and sustainability, are now very much shared ones. And equally, the challenges of poverty and inequality, and I would really underline that, are ones that are shared everywhere, where they're with us in the UK as much as they are in, in Africa, in Asia, in the rising powers. And I think this creates a very different kind of global context for thinking about business and development. Now, what we've heard about this afternoon is a lot of very, I mean, I would sum it up really, is a lot of optimism about the kind of revolution that we might be able to see through linking business and development to address not just growth, but growth that is inclusive, that's respecting planetary boundaries and ecological limits, and is meeting human rights and inequality and poverty reduction concerns. And speaker after speaker has given us a range of very exciting and positive examples. So um, we've seen the enormous contributions of business in innovation, whether it's around technologies, products, ways of delivering services, social innovations. We've seen the potential of businesses to create jobs, crucial everywhere. Um, and we've seen that sense of, of filling gaps and a kind of dynamic vibrancy to meet the needs of poor people in contexts where, as has been discussed, states are often failing to do so. Um, and I think some of the messages that have emerged for me, when I first looked at this programme, I thought quite a lot of our speakers are kind of from big business. But I think what's emerged from the discussion is the importance of small as well as big business, the informal as well as the formal, the roles of social entrepreneurs, of the grassroots kinds of innovation, of informal business actors as well as big ones. A lot of discussion about the potentials for, for big business to support small business and for them to work together. I think we've also had some really interesting examples which show that it's not just businesses, it's, it's about the interactions often in making things work between businesses and civil society, communities, states, um, a set of alliances in meeting challenges that are often very, very, very complex. But going beyond that, um, I think what's beyond the kind of positive examples, um, what I've been listening out for and have, have taken very strongly are some more fundamental challenges that I think this whole debate needs to face. And, and John Humphrey kind of summed it up quite early on, that we need to be thinking both about um, encouraging businesses to do less harm and encouraging them to do more good. Now I think the emphasis of today's discussion has been on the ways they're already doing more good and how they could do a bit more good. Um, I've often been working in contexts where one is really seeing businesses doing harm, quite serious harm, um, where we've got um, profit-oriented um, agricultural investments which are causing quite serious land grabs, where we've got um, the lock-in of energy supply companies in fossil fuel systems that are causing serious climate change. A myriad of other examples, and our, our, our Oxfam speaker revealed some of, some of those that are being looked at there. And I think this also very much needs to be on the agenda. There are businesses out there that are very much ignoring externalities or putting the social and the environmental out there as externalities that don't need to be taken into account. So I think part of our debate, and an aspect I'd like to hear more of, are about how to hold those businesses to account. Regulation, challenge, um, 
the roles of civil society and campaigns, um, and also standards, environmental and social standards, not just on paper, but how to make those standards real, how to embed them in practice, how to ensure that they're adhered to. Um, but then turning to how to encourage businesses to do more good, um, I think we've had some really fascinating examples here, which, which show, in a way, the importance of moving beyond what a few years ago would still have been talked about as a kind of corporate social responsibility, corporate environmental responsibility agenda. Very easy to either become very tokenistic or even write off as greenwash or social wash. What we've been discussing this afternoon, um, for the most part, are examples where the social and the environmental are being embedded into core business strategy and I think we've heard some really powerful themes and reasons why it makes sense for um, the sustainability of businesses and their economies in their own terms to think much harder about the, the social and the environmental um, ways in which they're operating. Whether it's been around ensuring the sustainability of supply chains into the future, having supportive community contexts, um, building up skilled labour forces, or indeed having a vibrant set of markets in which those businesses are operating. Um, so I think there's a very important argument coming through here that poverty reduction, reduced inequality, sustained resource bases are and need to be part of core business strategy. And that's great, that's a very positive story. Um, but I'd like to go beyond that actually again to, to draw out some of the tensions that I've also heard this afternoon. And one is that um, it isn't always quite so easy. There are cases where those long-term interests conflict with short-term profit, where firms and social responsibilities are thinking about different kinds of impacts over different time scales. Um, and there, I think, we need to identify what some colleagues of mine at IDS are calling kind of alignments and coalitions, rather than that core, that rather than assuming that there's a core interest there. There might be ways in which one can incentivize some working together in the short term while at the same time one tries to work to build and to change values and, and interests towards a stronger, more fundamental alignment of social and business goals of those multiple bottom lines. And I think there are some really important questions and some leads that we've heard here around the ways that, that donors, that NGOs, that governments, that international organisations and standards can help to build those, those alignments and make sure they, they're taken forward. A second theme that, that's often an area of tension that, that I've picked out this afternoon is actually about scale. We've heard a lot about the capacity of businesses to, to take things to scale, but yet I think what's also come through many of the examples is the importance of local context, whether it's in the Zambian agricultural example, whether it's in the ways that, that food and nutrition or health services are being rolled out. It's pretty clear that what poor people need and want, the, what it takes to make rights real in different contexts, what the ecological requirements of operating sustainably are, are very, very different. And these things are important. So what does that mean about scale? I think we're not just talking about finding an, a, a strategy and rolling it up and scaling it out. I think we're talking about something that's more about adaptive scaling, where one has ideas that are then bedding down in different ways in different, in different contexts. And I think we're also very much talking about not just scaling up firms um, and what they're doing, but we've heard a great deal about scaling out networks um, and, and, as it were, systems in which different kinds of business and other actors are operating, operating together. Um, and a final area that I think has come up again and again is this theme of system change. Now, I think there's also been a certain amount of tension as to what we really mean by, by system change. Um, to some, it's just been about kind of making the innovation system a bit more responsive and, and, and kind of getting actors to work better together. Um, 
to others, coming perhaps from a slightly different ideological viewpoint, system change might actually be about rethinking the way we think about growth and capitalism and profit motives. System change might actually be about rethinking some of those more fundamental assumptions about the nature of the system. Um, we might want to be thinking slightly differently about this assumption that, some, that businesses ought to be filling the gap left by a rolling back of the state. It's been quite a comfortable assumption in a lot of the, the, the plenary discussion this afternoon, that, that we can just accept that, that the state is not delivering and businesses should be filling that gap. But we might actually want to question that and say, are actually the, the, is, is it quite important to think also about rebuilding and reinforcing state capacity for the long term? Um, how can the public and private sectors work together in ways that build the public sector and rather than undermining it? And I think system change, as we've also heard implicitly, is not just about economics and it's not just about actor networks. It's also about culture and it's also about power, quite fundamentally. Whose system are we talking about and who shapes it? Um, so I would really kind of end by saying I've got enormous hopes for this business and development centre. I think it's going to be really exciting. And I think, um, as has been emphasised, it, it, it seems to me to be filling quite, a, quite an important need for evidence, evidence of what works, where, when and how. Um, evidence that can be objective, that can really delve deeply and look across, look across these different chains, which can look specifically at how things work out in, in different sectors. And, and some of the focal ones that the IDS work are going to be taking forward um, are around food and agriculture and nutrition, around health, and around energy and green transformations. They've also been themes that I think other speakers have highlighted as, as important. But I'd, I'd also like to see this centre as a place for for reflection and critical debate too picking up on the points that just came up at the end of at the end of the last session i think there are some more fundamental tensions out there i think if we went beyond the comfortable sort of consensus in this room we've got tensions that are political tensions that are ideological um, but also tensions that come from different places and different positions in this field um, so a good center i think would be a place for having some of those debates, um, being, as it were, a set of critical friends to, to business actors, um, but also constructive ones, and actually a place where we can have these debates openly and backed up by real evidence. Um, it also needs to be a place of mutual learning. Um, and. Uh, um, a place of mutual learning amongst firms and businesses, but also about amongst people who are in the donor community, um, in the NGO community, and who are working in very different countries. And I think here some of the shared experiences and, and different experiences that we're seeing across um, different countries, whether we're talking about Africa and Asia, whether we're talking about the rising powers and the growing experiences in the BRICS and the MINTS and these other actors acronyms that are being used are going to be very, very important. Um, so what are we going to do with all of this? What are some of the next steps for, for the centre? Um, well, one is what's going to happen after today. We're very keen to capture some of these key themes and issues that have emerged. It's been a very, very rich and useful debate and set of examples, I think. So there's going to be a report that's circulated of some of the discussions today, including the questions that were captured from the table discussions earlier on. Um, there are quite a lot of resources that have been picked up. You'll have seen people doing recording and taking photographs, and there are bits of film and some, some elements of uh, parts of the debate have been recorded and we'll be sharing those with participants through the website and, and in other ways. And we'd also encourage everybody here to sign up on, I think there have been various sheets circulating, to make sure that you're on mailing lists into the future and be, can be kept up to date with emerging news. Um, the Business and Development Centre has already produced a working paper and a policy brief which were, were in your packs. Um, they're both entitled Understanding and Enhancing the Role of Business in International Development. There are some upcoming further working papers which pick up on different themes, one on agriculture and nutrition, one on health, one on green transformation. Um, and they'll be forthcoming. You'll also have seen in your um, packs some rather mysterious little credit card size red things. I wondered what they 
they were. I've now been enlightened, actually, that that's a, that's a, a, a flash drive which has got some um, a number of other publications emerging from IDS on it. So do have a look at those. Um, they're a, a kind of link into the kind of resources that I think we'll be producing many more of. Um, I'd also like to mention that the Centre and the IDS Rising Powers in International Development Programme are going to be hosting an event in Brazil next week focusing on green transformation um, as part of the BRICS Academic Forum. That will, I think, be a very important event to, to carry on with what I flagged as mutual learning, particularly amongst those rising powers countries. Um, and the centre will be holding a series of future events which pick up on some of these other sectoral themes. And finally, um, a key focus of the centre's work and the, as the way I think we hope it will operate is as a, a go-to place for debate and evidence but also as a point in a network of collaboration. Um, we really want to focus on ways of working together um, and in this way we're very, very keen to maintain contact with all of you and as well as to widen our impacts and networks and partnerships with others. So I'd really like to conclude by saying please, please keep in touch and kind of watch this space um, as, as the centre moves forward and continue to tell us what you would like to see so that we can make it, make it useful to everybody. Um, please send us your ideas, specific ideas or more general ones about ways we could work together. And please continue the beginnings of that ongoing conversation by joining us for drinks um, right now over the next hour or so in the room there where we had lunch where there'll be a reception and we hope we can carry on with some informal networking. So I'm going to hand over to, to John, who I think has got some final, final words to say. But I'd like to say a very big thank you to all of you and to hope that we can continue to interact into the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can see from the reaction, and, and I all anticipated it, it's coming like a horror movie, you know, that uh, you just think you're about to escape, and uh, uh, a new demon appears to make your life uh, miserable. And I'm also aware that, as Melissa has just mentioned the drinks, then there's an even greater urgency for people to get outside and start socialising. So I should be incredibly brief. First of all, I'd like to thank the speakers, and I'd like to spank, thank all of you attendees for uh, coming to this meeting. I know that you all have busy schedules and that uh, you know, this is a time out of, uh, you could be doing other things and uh, we appreciate the fact that you've um, you know, shown your interest and commitment to uh, the work that we're trying to do. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, uh, the staff at IDS the, in, in the comms team, communications team who have done such a good job in bringing this event together and uh, you know, I think uh, without that, you know, without their help and, and their support uh, this would not have taken place and finally in terms of thanks I want to thank the, the students we have, a, we have a course on globalisation, business and development and most of the students from that course have come up today to learn more about business and development but also to, um, uh, to uh, work with us and to you know, provide support and I think they've done a fantastic job um, uh, over the course of the day um, and so let's give a round of applause for the people that have made it happen. Um, I'd like to thank you for providing us with a big agenda. I think Alistair Fernie is right to say that obviously we're not a large multinational corporation uh, because that's what we would need to be if we were able to do, do all of the things that you've asked. So we're going to be selective. Um, and, uh, but we're not alone in this, and so it's about developing the network so we can actually address these issues collectively rather than, than on our own, and that's also part of the function of today. And, and I take Alistair Fernie's point about uh, impact um, we do need a theory of change. We will be uh, working on precisely how we can turn uh, ideas into action, and uh, that's something which is very much on our agenda. So um, I just want to say that one of the ways of doing that is making personal contact and, dis and, and uh, getting to know people, because in the end, uh, academia and research is basically a, a people business and a personal contact business. You work with people that you trust. So what I want to do now is suggest that we go and do some personal contact and trust building in a convivial environment. So thank you very, very much for coming.